Thank you very much. And thank you very much to the organizers. Uh, I'll jump right in for in the interest of time. Uh, I'll be uh, beginning uh, the conference on uh, the Russian revolutionary utopias with the counterintuitive example of Leon Battista Alberti's uh, Hypnerotomachia Polyphili, published uh, in 1467. Leon Battista, oh, I'm going to. There. Uh, Leon Battista Alberti is the most well is most well known, of course, as the author of the first Renaissance treatise on architecture, De Re Edificatoria, published in 1485. <clears throat> Alberti didn't just write the most learned, erudite, clear treatise of the Renaissance. He put his ideas into practice and managed to become its most sought after and prolific architect. His book and his buildings revolutionized architecture. Alberti and Alberti alone is responsible for adapting antique classical architecture to the new building types, uh, something which holds for the period of the Renaissance up until today. There is no classicizing facade on the face of the earth of the past 500 years that does not owe a debt to him. Not surprisingly, therefore, the image we have retained from the treatise and from his architectural oeuvre is one of a supremely tempered, this is a, his own self-portrait uh, in the form of a medallion, um, it was, the, 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 the persona that, that his, he has projected, that we have retained of, from his oeuvre, is that of a supremely tempered, authoritative, cool, dispassionate, reasoned persona, one living according to the norm of concinitas, a, neolog a neologism that he himself uh, created in this very book, uh, with meaning a well-tempered natural harmony. This, is, this image is reinforced by the fact that in other writings, Alb Alberti was apt to condemn all forms of excess as the result of un ingenio troppo fervente e furioso. The uh, Mrs. Lefebvre, what? I'm sorry, I hate to interrupt, but you have to press hide on your computer on the bar. Oh. Let's see. I'm terribly um, sorry to interrupt. Hide. Okay. Here it is. Okay. Thank you. Did anybody see? Did everybody see that image? Hello. Hello. What? Hello. Hello. Yes, we we did see the image. Sorry. Okay, uh, should I go on? Yes, please, thank okay. you. Um, the Hypnerotomachia Polyphili is famous too. Published in 1499 at the press of Aldus Manutius, its typeface, uh, this is the cover, of the, this is one of the first images of the book. Its typeface, graphic design and woodcuts have made it what is universally considered one of the most beautiful, the most be perhaps the most beautiful book ever published. <clears throat> um, it is certainly one of the most coveted of all the early printed books. And by the way, Glasgow University has one of the 30 copies uh, in existence. Um, <clears throat> the Hypnerotomachia polyphily could not be more different from the De Re Edificatoria, on the other hand. There's never been a book shaped by a, no, a more full-blown ingenio troppo fervente and furioso. In its erratic, exuberant, extravagant, ponderous, intractable, unreadable, written and written in an intentionally incomprehensible mix of Latin, Greek, Hebrew, Arabic, uh, hieroglyphics, uh, and Chaldean. Uh, it, 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 uh, its intractability has led some readers to compare it to James Joyce's Ulysses. 
The Hypnorotomachia is a love story that is absurd, even by the standards of the genre. The hero falls asleep and wakens in a dream world where the hero Polyphilo, meaning lover of Polia, sets out on a hypnorotomachic hypno, quest for his beloved Polia. Polyphilo is transported all over the place and wakes up in a dream inside the dream and taken by some nymphs to meet the queen of, the, of this world, Eleftherelida, meaning freedom. Then he's directed to three gates, finds Polia behind one of them. They're taken to a, polia, uh, to a, to a temple, they're engaged, and uh, after a triumphal bacchanalia celebrating their union, they're finally brought together on the island of Scythia. Uh, and just as the lovers are about to be united, Polia vanishes into the into uh, into thin air. One aspect of the romanzo is that it sets and sets the novel apart from the others is that its narrative is shaped by expressions of unbridled orgiastic erotic furore. Uh, the uh, narrative abounds with naked bodies, um, and um, some of them were even um, some of the illustrations, which were thought to be uh, overly erotic, were censored uh, in one copy in the possession of the Vatican Library here. This is two examples. Uh, the, um, the book is generally attributed to Francesco Colonna. Uh, a renaissance, uh, well, uh, to, to somebody called Francesca Colonna, because of the acronym Frater Francesca Colonna Polia Paramavit, which is composed out of the first, uh, an acronym composed of the first letters of each one of the chapters. Scholars have been divided because there were two Francesca Colonnas at the time. One was a dissolute monk from Venice. Uh, the other was the scion of, a di of the dynastic Colonna family in Rome. I'll not go into why it's not possible for either of these two to have been the author and why all other scholars are wrong. Um, <clears throat> the reason for attrib my attribution of the book to Leon Battista Alberti is that there are a great number of remarkable uh, coincidences between his work and this. First, Alberti was not only an architect, <clears throat> he wrote seven, at least seven books on love that have been uh, ignored by other scholars. Second, a mere 30 pages of 370 of the book are devoted to the action of the actual love quest, to its dialogues and inner monologues. 200 pages are exclusively devoted to the description of the beautiful architecture uh, that uh, dots this, uh, that, that is contained in this perfect dream world. A great hybrid temple, pyram uh, hybrid temple and pyramid, which is half a kilometer high, alone takes up 50 pages, by the way, it looks a little bit like the cover of the, the, the building on the cover of this poster. Um, the great uh, uh, 76 of the first 78 pages are occupied by a painstakingly minute description of an ex exquisite boschetto, a palm grove, a, uh, um, a great uh, bridge and an octagonal bathhouse in which there are nymphs swimming and a palazzo. These descriptions are not just immensely erudite, they employ all of the neologisms Alberti had invented to describe architecture in the De Re Edificatoria. Uh, in addition, the philological sources for the architecture of both books are identical. Um, the rest of the book, uh, is taken up by descriptions of beautiful landscapes and gardens and antique uh, gardens. And we know that uh, besides being the most sought after architect of his day, he was also the most sought after uh, landscape designer and gar garden designer. 
In addition, the book is full of ingenious mechanical devices and Alberti is also known as one of the most inventive mechanical and hydraulic engineers of the Renaissance. The book features automatically opening doors powered by magnets, uh, uh, um, up, um, uh, mobile fountains on wheels, probably based on Hero of Alexander's pneumatics. And then there's a gigantic light bulb of glass suspended on chains from a ceiling on which are etched a skirmish, a skirmish of children riding dolphins. The wavering light projects the images onto the surrounding walls to give a cinematic quality to the moving picture. And in one building, there's a surface that not only reflects passersby as in a mirror, quote unquote, but also preserves their memory like a photograph. Fifth, Polyphilo loves polia, but polia means many things. And indeed, Polyphilo loves the many things in the book even more than he loves the figure of polia. He loves the gardens, he loves the mechanical devices, and especially he loves the architecture. Most of the erotic furore of the book indeed is directed to its buildings. To make a, a long story short, he even makes love metaphorically to one building. Not, um, uh, Yes, there are many other fingerprints Alberti left behind in his Ethnerotomachia. Among them uh, is the winged, the picture of the winged eye, quid tum, uh, with his quid tum. This is a drawing by Alberti himself. And uh, as you can see, he includes it in his, uh, also in his, um, uh, in his drawing uh, uh, from which a print was made for these hieroglyphics. And if you look, here is the eye again, uh, below his face in the medallion we saw in the very beginning. Most obviously, Alberti's job in life was as, was a, as a papal abbreviator. He worked in the papal court and as, a, uh, as someone who, wrote speeches and condensed speeches for the Pope. Uh, and th the painting on the left is of Alberti himself, and he's wearing exactly the same uh, uh, cloak um, as a papal abbreviator in the Hypner, as Polyphilo does in the Hypnerotomachia, Polyphilo. He's dressed like a papal um, abbreviator. Um, so, what is it that makes this polyphilic, hyper-erotic love story a utopia, and even a political, revolutionary one? The answer is that Alberti was a civil, was a civic humanist, who also wrote many political writings the targeted magistrates, priests, philosophers, writers, and merchants, denouncing abuses of power at every level of contemporary society. In his Pontifex, he attacks the corruption of priests, lamenting their crass ignorance and disregard for uh, education as they condone violence, nepotism, and the behavior of slothful parasites that they surround themselves with. In Commodus, he writes about the difficulties of a civic humanist in a society rapidly slipping towards autocracy. In, this encomium to, in his encomium to his dog, Canis, he compares himself to his pet, controlled by masters before whom he is powerless and doomed to silence. His book, Momus, in particular, abounds with disturbing images of violence. Uh, and is his most critical revolutionary uh, writing. It is aga aimed against the ruthless, sanguinary ferocity, rapaciousness, inequity, and mercenary behavior of the popes. For this humanist who referred himself 
always as a vir populi, a man of the people. Um, uh, it is here that he, that this man of the people, Momus, explains in the face of corruption of the corruption of the time, borrowing from Virgil's Aeneid, the phrase "armas armas viri," a call to rise up against tyranny. A phrase which the French Revolution was to translate as aux armes citoyens. Leon Battista, after all, was an Alberti. His family mansion was one of the birthplaces of Florentine civic humanism at the end of the 14th century. And for this, they'd been exiled following the Civil War. Uh, which uh, opposed them to the neo-absolutist uh, Albizzi faction that took over Florence. Uh, in parenthesis, there at the just before that there were had been two cities in Italy that had retained their status as republics, and that was uh, Florence and Venice. All the others had been taken over. The book. Paradiso degli Alberti, written uh, in the end of the 14th century, about that same time, describes the discussions that occurred in the house among fellow citizens of this, quote, illustrious patria, who devote all their time and attention to the affairs of our sacred republic in order to maintain her sweet liberty. Uh, the hypnerotomachia, polyphily, to go back to the book that we're considering, uh, refers to its own date of completion as 1467. In 1467, if he is the author of the book, Alberti would have been looking back at a singularly successful life crowned with every uh, honor and glory. He had been the architect of popes, he'd been the architects of uh, put of uh, uh, great industrialists of the time and financiers that included the Rucellai, the Medici, uh, and the Pope Nicholas V, who was also a humanist, uh, Pope who occupied the, the uh, papacy for about 10 years, uh, co creating an inter. Uh, 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 um, an interruption in the mounting um, tendency towards uh, autocracy in 1460. Uh, um, but in 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 1467, uh, Alberti would also have been looking back at uh, very recent history. Three years prior, in 1964, Pope Paul II, who replaced Nicholas V, the humanist pope was an anti-humanist and uh, who uh, set about firing all of the humanists that Nicholas V had gathered in Rome along with Alberti, Bessarion, Lorenzo Valla, Nicholas of Cusa, etc., etc. From then on until Alexander Borgia assumed the papacy, in the early six, um, up until the 16th, early 16th century, the city of Rome was there. The, the accession of Paul, Pope Paul II marked the beginning of the accession of the uh, Borgias. The hideous cruelty of this family in exercising their new power goes beyond the pale even of the Quattrocento, a period that Jacob Burkhardt saw as the bloodiest in the history of tyranny, atrocity, and abomination. In fact, the uh, humanists were not only fired, they were put in jail, and one of them uh, died in prison. Uh, looking over the scene, Alberti would have uh, uh, would have had uh, found much cause for distress. What he called in an earlier work, where he also described this uh, phenomenon, a rumni. 
Nicholas V, uh, like Alberti and the other humanists, was a sworn Republican. To be a civic humanist, let's be clear, meant that you were a humanist. It, was, it meant that you were a Republican in uh, the 15th century. He was a fear, and Paul was just as fierce an anti-humanist. Alberti uh, would have, as a result, seen himself, along with his fellow uh, humanists with Republican sympathy, sympathies, fired, imprisoned, and tortured. What he saw there would have inspired even more distress. The end of humanism, um, and the end of republicanism in Rome and the ensured rise of the Borgias. Written on the verge, so this would make the Hypnerotomachia Polyphili, as we will recall, written in 1467, something that had been written on the edge of a horrible abyss, too horrible to contemplate. Like Condorcet's, that Alex talked about, Condorcet's Le Progrès de l'Esprit Humain, written while he was waiting to be guillotined, and his wife Sophie's treatise on friendship following her husband's execution. The Hypnerotomachia Polyphili, deeply flawed as it may be, uh, almost incoherent, shaped by both a um, fantastic exuberance and extreme rage, the product of both passionate attachment to a vision of reconciliation and desperation at the spectacle of the upcoming collapse of the political conditions that were necessary for that vision's flowering. This ecstatically erotic, profoundly wrathful book can be seen not only as the legacy of a genius enamored of his life's work, but as a, a polemic manifesto in defense of civic humanism and all the beauty that it was capable of in the face of an increasingly aggressive anti-democratic order. Finito. Thank you. Thank you so much. Just right on time. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, 